Hello, this is Dennis Polis with another in the series of Open Philosophy videos. In this video we will begin our discussion of the laws of nature, beginning with a brief history. There's a lot of misinformation being circulated presently, for example by Stephen Hawking and Leonard Mlatinow in their book The Grand Design. They tell a tale in which the world believed that it was ruled by the whim of the gods until suddenly Thales of Miletus decided that the world was ruled by orderly laws and that the gods played no role whatsoever. It would have been far better had they checked their facts before they wrote their book. For example, Aristotle tells us that Thales believed that all things were full of gods. Also, in the Middle East, the idea of the order of nature was well established. So well established, in fact, that Jeremiah could use it as a paradigm of Yahweh's constancy to Israel. We read, Thus says Yahweh, who gives the sun for a light by day, and the ordinances of the moon and the stars for a light by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar. Yahweh of hosts is his name. If these ordinances depart from before me, says Yahweh, then the seed of Israel also shall cease from being a nation before me forever. If it were not an accepted fact that the ordinances of nature were fixed and enduring, this promise would be meaningless. Since Jeremiah was from the generation before Thales, we may conclude that the idea of order was already well established in the Middle East when Thales decided to make it the foundation of his philosophy of nature. This is all the more plausible when we realize that Thales was not of Greek but of Phoenician stock. Diogenes Laertius records that his parents were the Phoenician nobles Examais and Cleobulene. Jeremiah and Thales were both heirs of a Near Eastern cultural tradition which saw nature as the result of fixed laws and not the whim of the gods. The archaeological record makes the reason for this clear. Babylonian astronomy went back to at least 1800 BC. Thus, by the time Jeremiah wrote, there was 1,200 years of data showing that the processes and laws of nature were fixed. Thus, contrary to the tale told by Hawking and Blodenau, the idea of fixed laws or ordinances did not involve the rejection of God or the gods, but was in fact seen as a paradigm for the fixity of God's purpose and commitment. Of course, the idea of order in nature is not confined to the West. In China, the idea of yin and yang, that nature is the result of opposing forces in balance, goes back to the Yin dynasty, that is, from about 1400 to 1100 BC. Sometime around the 6th century BC, Lao Tzu wrote the Tao Te Ching. In it, he expounds on the Tao, or Wei which may be seen as the journey principle. The Tao implies an essential, unnameable process, the mystical source and ideal of all existence. Here again, the order in nature is seen as the reflection of a transcendent reality, the Tao. During the Hellenistic period, the West developed its own version of the Tao, the Logos principle. This was the idea that the order of nature is a reflection of mind. This idea finds its way into John's Gospel where we read in chapter 1 that the word or logos is made flesh and it becomes a basis for Neoplatonism. Again the laws of nature are not seen as standing independent but as tightly bound to some transcendent reality. In the interest of time we will skip over the Middle Ages let us pick up the story again with Nicholas Copernicus in the Renaissance. Almost everyone, educated or not, took the earth to be the center of the universe. This is what the senses seem to tell us. From at least the time of Aristotle, the Greeks had been working on a mathematical representation of the motions of the stars and planets. This culminated in the system of Ptolemy. The result was a highly accurate system. So accurate, in fact, 
that it was not until the work of Laplace around the beginning of the 19th century that the Newtonian system's predictions could equal those of the Ptolemaic system. So the accuracy of the Ptolemaic system was not a problem. What was a problem was its complexity. Renaissance minds believed that God, in his infinite wisdom, would design a universe which was far more simple and intelligible. Copernicus therefore decided to return to an idea first proposed by Aristarchus of Samos in the 3rd century BC, that the sun, not the earth, was the center of the universe. The Danish astronomer Tycho Brahe did a series of extremely precise measurements to resolve the conflict. His observations showed that comets were not atmospheric phenomena, but passed beyond the orbit of the moon. This was important because the Ptolemaic system was underpinned by the idea that the planets were somehow affixed to celestial spheres. If so, the comets would be passing through the spheres, smashing them. On the other hand, his data also disproved Copernicus's idea that the planets followed circular orbits around the sun. Toward the end of his life, Tycho Brahe hired a young assistant, Johannes Kepler. After Bray's death, Kepler was able to use his data to establish a new form of the Copernican system, one in which the orbits were not circular, but elliptical. Kepler's theory was based on three laws. These may be considered the first mathematical laws of nature. About the same time that Kepler was working in the north, Galileo Galilei was working in Italy. He found mathematical laws for projectile motion and built a telescope. With it, he discovered that Jupiter was orbited by moons of its own. Not only would this be impossible if Jupiter were attached to a celestial sphere, but more fundamentally, it established a principle that small bodies orbited large bodies. This made it more plausible that the Earth would orbit the Sun. As a result of their work, both Galileo and Kepler came to the conclusion that mathematical laws caused empirical phenomena. <laughs> The last point in the modern concept of a natural law is its universality. The Greeks had drawn a contrast between matter on Earth, which is constantly changing, and the matter in the stars and planets. The stars are fixed, and the planets followed orbits that repeated time after time. Thus, matter below the orbit of the moon, sublunary matter, was subject to change, while matter from the moon outward celestial matter was unchanging and timeless. The unreflective acceptance of this idea was a great stumbling block for the development of physics, for it meant that experiments performed on Earth could tell us nothing about what happened in the heavens. Thus Newton's great insight was that the same forces which caused the apple to fall on Earth could be responsible for holding the moon in its orbit. Thus the same laws apply both on Earth and throughout the universe. This is the universality of physical law. When you think about it, it should have been obvious by comparing the diagrams for the Ptolemaic and heliocentric systems. In the Ptolemaic system, the Earth's central position makes it special. But in a heliocentric theory, the Earth occupies no special position. There is, therefore, no reason to think that its matter is somehow different or special. Next time we will be asking what a natural law is, and we will be considering the difference between scientific or physical laws and natural laws. Goodbye until then, and thank you for your time and consideration.